Easy E, how are we? Shawnee, I'm wrecked. I'm after covering about 650 kilometers in helicopters. I am absolutely wrecked. How are you? Don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is not even functioning correctly enough to give you uh, a smart answer to that. So uh, for context, I think it's around six o'clock on a Sunday evening. I had two hours sleep or so on the couch, broken sleep, and that's probably the most I've slept since uh, Saturday morning because of Mondello 24 over the weekend. I know I've led this with me complaining, but it is a phenomenal event. It is a 24-hour race of luxury, in my opinion, because back in April, I was down, the and I love these other races I'm about to talk about, but I was down the country, middle of a storm morning, having a tent set up and all the rest, going up the mountains and just being destroyed with the rain. And then last month, doing the, the 100 mile, when we had a couple of ba- uh, bathrooms inside a building, it was phenomenal. This place, not only you have a massive setup in the garage, you have hot showers. I took a hot shower during this event. I don't know if I'm emphasizing how much of an amazing thing that is, but just to refresh <laughs> with a hot shower during it is class. Uh, atmosphere is pretty cool. And for, for four people that were in cyclists, I think we did all right. Um, I, as it went on, I, I learned a lot and it, it is a really, really fun event. And what distance did you cover? Um, you, you think I would have that in front of me right now? <laughs> um, I don't. I think we don't. I don't think we got the same distance as our next guest uh, coming up on uh, this episode of the podcast. I think it was around six fifty. So we originally decided to do. It's all right. That's okay. I, I don't really care. I just wanted my helicopter joke to make sense now. <laughs> anyway, so the, I gave uh, you that. I gave you that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what was it like? I suppose in terms of the team side of things. Um. Yeah, so we set up in the garage and stuff the day before, and then just between team before, we decided, right, we'll do 45-minute split, splits to start, see how everyone's feeling and stuff like that. What was really important, I was talking to, to Joanne on, on, uh, after one of the podcasts, was having someone there to, like, navigate, like, um, okay, that person's got one lap, someone needs to come get ready, someone passing over the wristband, stuff like that. Doesn't seem like a lot now, but, like, if, if like, we we had a WhatsApp group between the four of us doing it, and then Neve and Michelle there as well, who were huge help. So if, if I took off at, let's say, 10.45, it was like, right, you're expected to come back roughly 11.30. But that changed, like, during it, like, I was... I was getting used to going on to getting caught into trains and stuff. And I'm like, I am going to keep going until this train is, is gone because I'm doing my, like after 45 minutes, I'm doing my best laps. And if you're not in a train, your, your times just go way down. And then, but when you are in it, it's like, if I can hold this for as long as possible. So there was one of them during the night where I was going 90 minutes and the first few laps I found when, when I was out, people were a bit hesitant on it. Maybe it was just when I went out, because sometimes you go out and there's nothing there. Or you'd see a train halfway through. You're like, oh, I just missed that. I, I have no hope now. I'm going to be out here for a while by myself. It wasn't as packed as I thought it'd be. And then sometimes you get out and like half a lap in, you just see a train about to pass. And they're like, hop on in. And you're just in you go and everything just goes so <laughs> smoothly. It was deadly. So just make friends with people down there and, and and you're off to the races, literally. Brilliant. So would you recommend to a friend? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, you know what? The, the, the solo people both amaze me and made me think I would never, ever do something like that. Just 24 <laughs> hours on a bike and trying to grind. I know I've done running, but I'd rather run than do a cycle any day of the week still. I still don't consider myself a cyclist after all that, but just to try and grind out 24 hours. But when you're in a group and you take that, there's a pros and cons, so you take that time off and recover. But same time, it was so hard to get back up and going again. So like you, you'd finish your lap and when it was shooting night or not, you were buzzing. And then you'd have a bit of food and you're sitting there and you're getting the tea sweats and all of a sudden you feel a little bit tired and you're groggy and you're like, eh. you try and sleep, you wake up twice as bad, feeling like you got a hangover on you. So like I say, most of my last stints, I was getting the bike ready to go going, fuck this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but then after a lap, right. you wake up and you go again. like Because uh, and, and, I wasn't used to, I'm just used to going, right, I'm on my own, come back in, Neve, what do I need? Just, throwing food into me, keep me fueled up and go again. And, and having that adrenaline 
keep going in, not adrenaline over 24 hours but there's something to keep pushing 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 whereas when you come in after whatever the 45 minute stint or an hour or 90 minutes whatever it was and it's definitely longer through the night is a good thing it's just like you, you come down so fast and then trying to build yourself up to go again is pretty tough yeah and i suppose that's why joanne mentioned having the turbo trainer or, or exercise bike in the in the I was about to say hangar, but in the garage, just to warm yourself up for to get over that grogginess so that when you hit that bike, you're you're ready. We use that turbo trainer the exact same way most people use a turbo trainer as an exercise bikes and treadmills during COVID. <laughs> uh, left it in the it, corner. Left in the corner <laughs> clothes rack. <laughs> We started with at the start and I was like, we are not good enough to get, I, I speak to myself, I wasn't good enough to get a good warmth to go again. I had a certain pace and that was it. So like during the night, it, it pissed a bit when I was out there and it was pretty dark and you know, I had the glasses on me just so I could like, see a bit clearer and it definitely worked. But I was like, I, I'm not good enough cyclist to take these corners any sort of speed. So my timings just went down and I was like, I, 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 I'm not good enough to keep control of a bike and try and go fast. So it's just keep ticking over, do what you can. But then the next day during the night, I was lucky enough to someone behind me in the train. I was like, oh, I'll take over now. And then like we start getting a load of people onto the train and going through the laps and like just making friends and making life a little bit easier going around. And that's the one I did for 90 minutes. It was, it was pretty cool. P- people are pretty cool then. Uh. You can you can tell that's when competition turns into survival. <laughs> Yes, that's it. Because I think the first few... Now, I could be totally wrong with this, but I got the vibe when I went out first was that everyone was like, you know, get your laps up and try and get that. And then it's like, for some, obviously, they've been there a few times that they knew. Get to, And there was trains. And like, I remember one stage I saw a train and I was like, they look like they're going 40, 45 kilometers an hour. And I'm like, no, they're not. I'm just doing that because I'm not as able to go as fast as they are. But then I hung behind one for all of five seconds. And I looked to watch... 42.9 and I couldn't keep going I was hoping a puff and they were going like they are going that fast so like there was some incredible incredible cycles like I don't going down the ring at Kerry going downhill I was going 45 <laughs> kilometers an hour compared to what some of these these guys and girls are doing down there absolutely fast like we had Chrissy who was in the podcast a couple of months ago I was talking to her at the end I was like hey you got on it's like ah we won you know yourself I'm like <laughs> she didn't say exactly that way but just very nonchalant about it um yeah and it was it was pretty cool in that respect very good and uh, i suppose it was nice to be the local celebrity down there yeah <laughs> ah, no, absolutely, <laughs> no. <laughs> absolutely we, had, uh, we had that many i was seeing the stories coming through of people tagging you randomly and things as well it was absolutely oh. brilliant so <laughs> um it was Actually, absolutely brilliant shout out to um anto lee who was running the, the pop of racing stuff down there from dunna d and um, he gave me the um, it was like I've got something for you in the van I was like what is it and I was like bam Ireland bam tastic just different bams for I, I, I wish I had it in front of me so I have the different labels on it like what's the crack and stuff on it and so I was going back <laughs> and looking at it going his face are on me so like I threw that on me and for the first 12 13 hours it was like there's actually no shaving no nothing this is absolutely yeah, brilliant yeah, uh, small bit during the second half because I had a shower I've got to put the thing back on again so like the last yeah. time coming out in the saddle I'm like why didn't I use it <laughs> <laughs> absolutely excellent and I suppose it, it is an endurance race you've done two 24 hour events it's been an addiction I suppose that's turning into and, and, and what you've done and a lifestyle and I suppose that leads into our next guest absolutely and i wish i could talk more about my next guest eric but i'm not gonna lie i don't have my notes in front of me and i know we just recorded the podcast three, uh, three four days ago Stephen. actually speaking to Stephen, because he, he he was in my head after we recorded this podcast we were talking for a good while afterwards and he had done the solo we'd also done the partner one and he had talked about the hairpin so he goes down the hill into the hairpin and one time he just kind of lose control of the bike and the bike starts sliding. He starts sliding. He's like, all I could think about is when do I stop sliding so I get back on my bike? And he gets back on the bike, comes back around into the pits. And like, he's like, I need my bike fixed up to come to go again. And I look at him and he's destroyed. And he's like, you're not going back out there, pal. He's like, oh, get me ready to go again. I think his partner went down. Uh, and then later on, he, he was back on again. But every time I went down that hill, I think I did around 60 or so laps. But every single one going down a I just thought of him sliding so much so that like it, it, the guys that I did the the event with, they're listening. I was like, I couldn't tell them. 
because I didn't want yeah, it in their yeah, head yeah, that people yeah. slid at that stage. So I just kept thinking of that story. Yeah, speaking of 24 hour events, this, this is this is the 24 hour national champion. Yeah, it's it's he has some fantastic stories. An episode that probably could have went on for four hours, but to avoid us dragging it out to nearly that with the intro, but we had to give you credit for another excellent event. I'm very jealous. I'm not jealous of the 24 hour running, but I'm very jealous of the the Mondello 24. It seemed to be absolutely excellent. But for those of you who are listening, this one is a really, really, really good episode. If it doesn't motivate you to take on some new challenges and believe in yourself. We don't know what is, and it's part of the great thing for us of having front row seats to these great, great guests. So here is this week's episode of the Any Given Run Day podcast. Let's go. So last week on the podcast, we had Gary and Martin Hughes on talking about how they're going to cycle from one, top of the Ireland to the bottom of Ireland, Madden to Mizzen or Mizzen to Madden Head, whatever it was are going to be. And uh, I gave Eric a little bit of abuse about that because it took him a couple of days to do it and they planned doing it in 24 hours. And Eric's like, it's going to happen sooner or later. Someone's going to make you feel like shit as well. And our next guest in the podcast does that because <laughs> last month it took me damn near 24 hours to do 100 miles. And our next guest, the podcast, as of last weekend, set the new Irish national record of 100 miles with a time of 13 hours, 18 minutes, and 33 seconds. I'll do the maths for you. That is an average of 4 minutes, 57 pace a kilometer. Bananas. Stephen Murphy, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. I'm glad you're sitting down because you cannot be standing up after that. (laughs) I've been warned against it. Everybody's telling me, if I fucking see you put up something on Strava, I'll come and get you. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I start following you. Help me sell your Strava just morning run. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people are, yeah, just the same. They're just kind of like, will you just stop? Even this weekend is like, I know it's topical with Mandelo 24 this weekend, but I got an invitation to come do it. And I was like, I haven't been on the bike in a while. Will I do it? And it's like, no, you just need to, you know, cool, cool the jets, cool the jets. I think you should do it just to piss Sean off. He's going there and he hasn't got a Scooby do what he's doing. So uh, yeah, it'll definitely. Fucking, I'll I go there, Sean. The Come in behind me. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. don't because stay I stay know. Like we have a team of four doing it and like yeah. relay wise, we're like maybe we'll get like hundred fifty k each, roughly, because we're not bad yeah. cyclists. And then I was going to your Instagram and you did it solo last year. You had 685 kilometers. So so please don't come down and beat us as a team of four <laughs> relay by yourself. I, I'd feel awful about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's harder. It's easier to get along with yourself for 24 hours on the bike, you know. <laughs> team element makes you suffer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, this so, episode will drop after my dad, so I won't say nothing about my partners just yet. <laughs> so... Talk to us about how this started. How did you become a lunatic? Uh, no, I mean, uh, an, an athlete <laughs> who's set national records and, and doing so. And secondly, uh, I've been working on it here in the build up to the mm. podcast. I'm actually doing a list of all the things you could have done in the 11 hours you finished ahead of Sean's 100 miles. Uh, I posted up during the I posted up during the week, everything from doing the dishes to cutting the grass. Like, it's, it's amazing what you can get done in the time. At my speed or at Sean's so. speed. <laughs> I just doubled the amount again. Uh, I'm sorry now, but the comparison has been set there now. This is what I'm going to be for. So, how did this start? Uh, I suppose, I... I was never into sports when I was younger. I was never, I was always put onto teams. My parents put me forward for every kind of a thing, but I was never sporting or sporty by any means. I sat on the bench for every underage match I went to. I was put forward for like running and sent in for swimming and always hated it, never enjoyed it. I remember there's a thing in Minimus that we had to do. It was like, it's on say it's like a triathlon only with ponies instead of bikes and I remember my my mother was there with all her friends and they all put their kids forward and they were all like elite athletes at a young age and I did the horse riding bit I did the swimming bit and she said at the start line of the race I just sat down on the ground and said Brita I'm not doing this I've no interest in running I don't care about it and she was like, you fucking will do it. She was like, and she, had, she said she had to give me 50 pound back in the day to do it. Now, I think that's the best prize money I've ever made from any race. But uh, really, it was 
I suppose in my 20s, I kind of went through a hard time. A lot of people do kind of trying to find yourself. I struggled with my weight. I struggled with self-confidence. And there was one day that I just went to the local park and I said, you know what, I'm going to take action on it. And I said, I'll do I'll do one lap at the park. It was about a kilometer route. And I said, I'll do one lap at the park. That's a starting point. And I got about 300 meters and calved. And <laughs> I said, I said, look, it's a starting point. I took a, a rock out of the hedge, put it down on the ground and said, right, what I do the next day is I surpass that. I just move past that rock. And I did. I might have got an extra 50 meters the next day. And there was a huge sense of achievement going, look, at least I'm making forward progress rather than the regression I'd perceived. Mm. So day after day, I went back and pushed that rock up that other little bit every day. And eventually I got the full round of the park and the rock was insignificant. And to this day, like I, I still push that rock along. I'm still, I say it as in, it sounds self-destructive, but trying to find my breaking point, which I really am. <laughs> like, I just... I just try different things. I switch between disciplines. I get huge enjoyment out of it. The process, the growth, kind of knowing that every run might be a fraction of 1% towards your goal. And I suppose when it went kind of, when it went a bit obsessive and that is like what everybody with COVID, if you're into baking bread, you baked a lot of bread. <laughs> you baked a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> like when COVID came for me, like nothing changed, only the obsession increased. I was like, the more time I had to run and push the distance, like until 2020, I hadn't done an ultra marathon. I've only been running about six years altogether. And yeah, I remember I went over to a training camp, Unit 27 over in Thailand. And it was the first time that I really figured it out that the body isn't the limit. The mind is the limit. And I remember one day there's this big statue up in the hills, big Buddha. And it was after a long day of training. And I wasn't a runner at that stage, but I said, if I started running up to that, I was like, what's going to be, what's going to stop me from getting there? And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to stop me. Will my legs give up? Will my mind give up? Will I just die? <laughs> like, you know, so <laughs> I went up to it and back down. And it was a half marathon. And I said, you know what? I got a lot from that. And yeah, ever since I've just, I suppose I took on the Kerryway Ultra was my first big endurance event. Like I did very well at that the first year. That's just 185 kilometers, I think. And yeah, I came ninth in that. So I kind of found that I had a knack or an aptitude for it and I found flow with it. And then since then I've completed Ironman, an Iron Man. I haven't just completed Iron Man. <laughs> I completed an Iron Man, like Mondello 24 hour cycle. You know, this hundred mile thing is a new enough thing for me. Like, you know, I just found that I enjoyed the endurance element of trail running. But then on top of that, I enjoy my road running and I join I run with the Tullamore Harriers here. So I said I just mix it all together, what I enjoy, and I'll just start doing long distance road running. Steve, I'm going to pull you back a small bit on this one. You talked about breaking points. And you talked about COVID. Mm. I had a breaking point around August 2020. I, I went for a meal with a mate. And, uh, you know, we are there for two hours. And, of course, we were kicked out because it was during COVID time. And we went across the road to the pub. And we went to the point, And I had to pay €14 Euro for some chicken tenders and chips. And it was too stuffed to eat it. Mm. So I basically paid 20 odd quid for a pint. And that, that was a breaking point for me. But mm. uh, August 2020, you... You did something pretty insane for that month. You you didn't do like 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers or anything like that. You did 3,700. Do I have the month right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's If anybody's trying to get into my laptop, it's still the password for my laptop, August 2020. <laughs> because... <laughs> How in the name? Like, I, like we were just yeah. happy to, to, to get out of... I was just like, mm. I live in Kildare, so we had extra lockdowns yeah. during that time. To get out of there was even fun, like during those two, three weeks. But you went around the entire country for, for what four weeks on a bike unsupported. Yeah. How, how did this come about? Yeah, I suppose the same as everything. Like, you know, COVID just hit like a train. Like at the start of COVID, like I lost my job. I was recently out of a relationship. 
I had to move out the house I was renting and move back in with my parents. And like literally my whole world just came came crashing down. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I said, look, you have to find an opportunity in this. In every in every bit of adversity you face in life, there is opportunity. So I I had done the Ring of Kerry cycle the year before, and I'd never or not the year before, in months before. And I'd I'd never really cycled that far, but I got a lend of this real flashy bike off my friend, a lovely S Works Roubaix. It was gorgeous. And when I was down cycling the Ring of Kerry, I came back at one stage from one of the aid stations to my bike. And there was like a load of grown men just standing around my bike. And they said, I walked up and I was like, uh, they said like, oh, Jesus, lovely bike. And I said, oh, thanks a million. It's not mine. I said, I got a lend of it. And they looked me up and down and said, we know it's not yours. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> that day I was like, I was like, fuck it, I'm buying this bike. So uh, my friend that lent it to me, I bought the bike off of, and I paid way too much for it, but I bought the flashy bike. So at the start, at the start of COVID anyway, I was trying to think of what am I going to do with this time? Where's the opportunity in, in, in this kind of otherwise misery? And one day I was out working on, on my father's farm and I just said, I wonder how far it is around the coast of Ireland. I say it's like a thousand kilometers or that. And I mapped out the <laughs> outermost. Yeah, I mapped out the outermost route around Ireland. And I was like, oh, three and a half thousand kilometers. I was like, how would I be able to do it or wouldn't I? And I said, you know what? This is my goal. I was like, I'd only ever cycled. The Ring of Kerry is the furthest ever I'd ever cycled on the bike. Even like as far as training goes for my cycle around Ireland, I did a 116 kilometer cycle one day. And I said, do you know what? that's enough focus on my admin and pe preparation for it because I know I like to you know I have I have a month or I've ever, however long to kind of get good and competent at cycling so without telling anybody I started putting together a kit I remember I bought a little travel soap it was the first thing I invested <laughs> in was like a little thing and I was like this is what I'm going to wash myself with and then it just kind of it was like no helmet just soap yeah, just so that's it. Yeah, yeah. Lubricate the landing. <laughs> but uh yeah, so like all of a sudden I was like, it's like in the films when you see like the prison warden walks by the cells and everybody's asleep. And then when they pass, the boys start digging. That's the way I was because I knew if I told anybody about it, they'd say it was mad. They'd say I couldn't do it. They'd say I wouldn't do it. And I said, you know what, this is a complete solo endeavor from day one, from the inception. It was a solo endeavor. So I did everything my own way, even the way like, you know, it's a road bike. It's like a carbon frame, like road bike that I did it on. It wasn't a touring bike. I didn't have the fancy luggage or anything. I had a yeah. bag on my back doing it. I had an A-frame bag and I just made it up completely myself. And two days before I went, I told family and friends that I was going to do it and they're like where's this after coming from <laughs> like you know they didn't know <laughs> and I was like this is just something that I want to do and I remember went down to Kinsale to start and got my friend to drop me down and literally just as casual as as you like just he got like I I was just like this was my life at the time and I just got on my bike and started cycling just started cycling west and went around the entire coast of Ireland, basically over 27 days, having no cycling experience or anything with, with my tent and everything on the bike, everything that I'd need to survive for the 27 days. I didn't know how long it was going to take me. I had no plan. I didn't know where I was going to stop. People kept asking me, oh, where can we meet you along the way? Where will you be in two days time? I was like, I don't know, because like I made it up every day. I stopped at people's house, knocked on their door and said, can I sleep in your garden? And then ended up sweet talking them into them making me steak dinners. <laughs> like, you know, like I, 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 did, I didn't slum it around the country by any means. I was like, I was put up down in the park hotel down in Kenmare by the, by the Brennan brothers and all this. And they had a butler, they had a butler out putting up my tent with me. And like, you know, it's like, but like basically just kind of drifted or whatever my way around the country. And like, you know, it kind of really, pushed my perception of what is achievable or what is doable if you just say don't think about what's done 
don't think about what's to do, just kind of live in the moment on these things. Yeah, so that was the start of it. There's so, so what many was part of it? Sorry, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, here we go. Where do you go with that? Like, like, I know, like I know. Staying I from night to I'm night. Ready. And like, your Instagram stories is phenomenal. Like, um, like I saw, like you're in the Giants Causeway and uh, your 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 posts are sorry, and like you're like it's lashing rain and like this day I'm not gonna be able to go far. And the next day you're you're off on the bike again, like with no plan. It's just that's yeah. bananas to me. Well, I don't like, even have a you, question. Like, when would you ever get the chance to do it again? Like you know, everything just. Like, don't wish for apart, COVID. Apart back. from that murmur in time <laughs> with COVID, like when would you get the chance to do it again? Like, you know, it was like it was like a life calling that I had to do it, or it was like a call to action because like I made so many lifelong friends on that trip. Like Dan that crewed me in Belfast last weekend. Like I met Dan on that trip around Ireland. Like I like and the same as well, do you know, when you when you're kind of when you achieve something like that, or you know, like whatever your discipline, when you surround yourself with doers and shakers, like, you know, mm. everything seems possible when people don't see the limitations of things, when everybody around you is an enabler, like it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't made banana bread twice. since 2020. So like, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really remember so anyway, my back then, Eric. <laughs> I reckon you can uh, cycle across America. I reckon I could too. It all comes down to funding at the end of the day. Doing, John, look, it's in his head. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, but like, honestly, like, I don't think, I don't, I don't limit myself to anything. Like, in the sense, I, I see other people and say, sure, if, if they're human, they have two arms, they have two legs, they can do it. I can do it. And like, sometimes I always think people say like, oh, Jesus, I'd love if I had your ability. I'd love to, I'd love to be able to do what you do. A lot of ways I'm like, I'd love to have everything taken from me again that I've built. Just go back to that insecure 20 something year old, overweight, yeah. highly sensitive like guy and just be like, start from there again. Cause I do it all again. Like, you know, I know, or like, you know, I'd love to like just have the power to assume somebody else's body and just be like, Take I'm gonna over make, for a year. I, I'm gonna make a me out of you, kind of like not in a superior way, but like yeah. just that like you know there was never anything special about me i didn't come from like <laughs> like pedigree or i didn't come from a sporting background or i never had like kind of insane coaches or you hear about so many people that were like swimming like you know at a at a, at a national level at a young age and they can carry that on through different sports like i didn't have that everything i built was organic and everything was just it just came from a curiosity and that's what i think is is my biggest power is uh, our greatest power is that like i don't i don't i wouldn't be huge on reading up about these things or about about following other athletes i'm just curious as to what's the best way to do them what's the limits what works best for me and like it's a very intuitive approach towards it. Like with my training, I don't have a coach. I know how I feel every day. I know the work that I have to do to get to where I want to go. I know the life choices that have a positive or a negative influence on future outcomes of races or challenges that I do. And I think it's good to have that kind of internal compass rather than depending on somebody else to do it. If you can, like, you know, there's a time and a place for both. I did have a, a great coach, Shane Finn, down in Kerry, who did teach me great discipline. And that discipline still carries on. But one of the greatest things he ever taught me was keep it fun because fun is sustainable. And that's what I see uh, with everything. Like, you know, when you start taking stuff too seriously, the fun goes out of it. You're doing it for the wrong reason. Like, you know, to be able to do it for the crack, like it's great to go out and be able to get a national record because you're doing it with the boys and it's what you enjoy <laughs> doing. Like, no, but you know, honestly, yeah. like, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's great not to take it so seriously that it becomes all encompassing yet serious enough that you can achieve great things at it. 
How do you pick your 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 challenges then? Like the the next race is the next race and the next challenge. Then is it literally just this event looks like great crack to you? Because you've done a wide range of things. Like you you've done the Ironman in Kashkai, then you've done Mondello twenty four, Wicklow two hundred. Then you're like you then you're doing you are Connemara hundred mile. There's so many different things. It's just like what's coming up in the next three four months. What kind of events will go there? Aim towards that, or what way do you approach it? Again, it's 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 like my training for all the world. I don't, or it's like my cycle around Ireland. I don't plan these things. I kind of just trust the process that the next thing will arrive. Like every year I seem to have, or even just kind of mapping out kind of achievements that I've had. Like every September, August, September, October, around that period, I'll do something big. So every year I have to achieve I don't have to, but it just turns out the way that I build towards something big at that time, which was Ironman, which was a cycle around Ireland, which was this year's Connemara. In September, I'm taking on Spartathlon over in Greece, 250 kilometer race. Like, you know, this time of year I build towards. And then the rest of the year, I just kind of fill in with whatever piques my interest, to be honest. Like, I don't feel compelled to do anything like I've. I know at the moment I'm road racing as such. I'm doing hundred mile was is is my thing at the moment. But like we could talk in six months and I could be an avid fisherman. <laughs> like, you know, that's just the way it is. Like, you know, honestly, like, you know, I don't I don't I don't do these things to be the best at what I'm doing. I do it because it's what lights me up at the time. And it's what I have a burning desire to be better at every day coming to the pinnacle of a goal that I set like Ironman like I couldn't swim I was like I couldn't swim six months before Ironman to be honest I couldn't swim the day of Ironman but I don't know how it actually happened yeah no really like I really struggled I was getting panic attacks in the water for months I was I was literally there was times even in sprint triathlons like I I did maybe three or four sprint triathlons in my in my lead up to Ironman so I went straight from the sprint triathlons to Ironman like three of them sprint triathlons I ended up one of them I had to get taken out of the water two of them I basically doggy paddled through the 750 meter swim but whatever when I got into that water in in Kashkai sometimes I think that in reality, I actually drown in that water. And this is just an alternate reality yeah. where, like, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, this is just like where my spirit went. But, uh, like, I had a powerful swim. It's just something that I can just find in the heat of the moment. I can find a focus and, and a flow that, like, you know, that time doesn't exist. You know, the, the struggles you're going through doesn't exist. It's just kind of, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful thing to unlock, but it's, it's true sharpening sharpening my sword over and over again through doing these things and that's the one thing i don't want to lose it's people you know people will always say like when are you going to stop or when are you going to just like give it a rest or would you not just do marathon or something instead but like when i look back at where i started this journey in my 20s and when i was unhappy when i felt unfulfilled i remember actually what used to haunt me at that time was there was a film that i watched and there was a line in it that said, there's nothing worse in life than wasted potential. And that haunted me at that time. Do you know, it might, and if I, if I heard it now, it would be insignificant. But yeah. at my lowest point, I heard that and I said, fuck, like, you know, I can't get that out of my head because I always knew I had more in me. I always knew I wasn't meant to just lie down and take it or, you know, like I remember being low and going to the doctor and the doctor giving me antidepressants and came back and said, they're not working. So it gives me double the amount of the antidepressants. And <laughs> I just said like, you know, no, this isn't the way I was meant to be the same again. Even at that stage, I knew this hurt. I'm meant to be feeling for a reason. Like, you know, like you don't want to, you don't want to not feel it. You want to feel it, learn from it and overcome it. So like, that's, that's, that's been everything. My whole life is, just repetition of that same thing. It's amazing though, when you say people are saying, when are you going to stop? When are you just going to go, go for a park run or when are you going to do yeah. that? I think what a lot of people find with people who do ultras and stuff is 
they struggle to see where you find the time to commit or they feel like you're giving up what they call a life. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying that any side is right or wrong. It's just, mm -hmm. I suppose what they struggle to understand. And my next question is, is there an element you feel you sacrifice? You talked about sacrifices or is this just the life you want to live and, and not doing this is the sacrifice for a, for a healthier life or, or where is the confusion or, or what do you give up in order to keep this uh, a healthy attitude towards training? Yeah, well, nothing, nothing worthwhile in life comes without sacrifice. And like, I have a highly pressurized job. I manage it, manage a team. I have a lot going on in my own life anyway. I have a lot of other passions. I'm, I'm studying a master's at the moment. I'm looking at building a house shortly. Like, you know, it's not like all I do is run, but like you make time. Like I get up at half five every morning to run before work to get my training in before work in the evenings I do my run I do, I've basically in the lead up to this I've basically had seven months of double days running morning and evening oh. and for the most and yeah and then closer to it it was triple because I started doing like strength and condition I started doing circuit classes before my run in the morning just to go out on tired legs because in my mind i felt if i keep going out on fresh legs in the morning you're only ever training for the the early stages of the race like you know if you're running a marathon and you only train for the first 10k like you're going to get some shock in the last 10k but going out and training on the tired legs made a huge difference but like that most people in my life wouldn't know what I was up to because I don't talk about it. Like, you know, if you see it on Strava, you'll know, or like, you know, if people around, even people stop me here in, in Tullamore where I'm living and they'd be like, I'm sorry, but how do I see you running all the time? <laughs> like, you know, but like, I, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't obsess over it or like, you know, it's, it's something that I do for myself personally. It's not for glory. It's not for accolade. Like I love, again, when you surround yourself with a community and like all my friends are into it, they're all people that, that appreciate it. Like, you know, it just becomes a way of life and it really does. And like, even for me in the morning, like they hate my, my team hate me in the office because when I come in that door straight away, it's like, you know, I'm on because I've had all this time to to think in the morning, to, you know, to align my thoughts, to get my day in line. So it's not as if like, I'm going around <laughs> just like listening to music, bobbing away. Like, you know, it's, it's focused effort all the time. And it's, yeah, like, look, it is, it's sacrifices. You know, there's other things that I'd like to be doing. There are things that I'm regretful that I haven't been able to partake in, like social events, things like that. It's not that I can't partake in them, but like I've got, very used to not drinking now and it, it doesn't even affect me anymore i'll go to events and you know i still have a few drinks but if i don't have them i'm i'm still happy enough now but like to answer your question yeah like the sacrifices are great but what's to be earned is far greater you, you talked about something so go ahead. sorry sean even with the like those who say about it it's it's something that's around us and even the likes of gaa teams will put in an alcohol ban and stuff since i've moved mm. to the middle east the the whole alcohol thing is just yeah from non-existent for me and it's it's yeah. actually been really really good um and yeah. the best part is over here no one questions you no one's like why aren't you drinking yeah. <laughs> it's just like it's kind of like why are you drinking over here so it's yeah uh, it's a it's a hell i don't know what media is I don't know what comedian said it, but it's like alcohol is the only the only drug that see people see as a problem of having if you're not taking it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's so true. It's so yeah, true. But I see there's a big turn as well. Like I don't know, is it since COVID or is it just maturity or better understanding of your body and your health? But like, I I see with more and more people that like especially like down the country is different but if you're if you're in dublin now and you're in a pub 50 percent of the people are probably drinking non-alcoholic mm. drinks like which is class like because it's not just get smashed or it's not like you know it's not acceptable to be falling around the place but like i know myself i i can't see the payoff in sacrificing a few hours on a saturday night 
for feeling fresh and going out and doing a long run or doing a long cycle on a Sunday and, you know, capping off your week well, rather than like, you know, just trying to survive of a Sunday and like. <laughs> and of a Monday and of a Tuesday and a Wednesday yeah, and yeah. again in my case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, so when you did your 20, you broke the, the, the 100 mile record last week. Officially, yeah. you broke it. Uh, and you've talked in the podcast, but not being about accolades and stuff. And what I find at Bananas is that that was unofficially your second time breaking the record because you did that in Connemara the year before doing 13 hours, 32 minutes. Did you set out for that race knowing that you were going to potentially beat the national record and for it not be counted as beating the national record? Because it really goes back to just you saying earlier, you, you went out for the crack for, for a hundred mile run yeah. with the lads. No, I got the lads together and I went to Connemara to win that race. I didn't know what the national record was. I didn't know what the course record was. I didn't know anything about it. But that was that was the first time that I kind of put it on the table that I was going to win. Like, you know, there wasn't any two ways about it. I was going mm-hmm. to win that. Like, I wasn't going to come second. I wasn't going to participate. Like, How I many 100-mile races had you done to this point? That was my first hundred mile race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, you had the mentality to win the thing. <laughs> hey, yeah, you know, but pacing yourself, I, I like. I'm assuming that's a little bit over a five minute kilometer pace. If, if you did four fifty seven for your thirteen eighteen, like yeah, that was five oh one pace. Five oh one in Connemara, but like again, Connemara had huge elevation. The conditions were a lot worse. I had rain throughout Connemara. There was high winds up there as well. Um, there was traffic on the roads. You were going through populated areas, and then the camber on the road ended up wreaking havoc on my body as well because your right hip is constantly up higher because, like, the camber at the side. Yeah, elevation in the road, yeah. 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 Yeah, it was something that I hadn't even factored in before then. Um, and as well, like say, up, up there, we had to stay on the left-hand side of the road. You'd normally run on the right-hand side, but we had to go on the left-hand side. So say I would have been doing all my training, running on the right-hand side of the road. And then right. when I went up there, it was like, like, it was like a double effect because it wasn't just balancing it out. It was like counterbalancing it. But like that, like there was... Like I take on Connemara again any day before Belfast with the with the one mile loops, like just it it just it just compounds the fact that it it's it's your body over or your mind over your body that is the limiting factor because when you're stimulated by your surroundings by getting to the next town to the next crossroads when the scene scenery is just changing all the time, like it's. It is powerful. And then even like with the hills, like, you know, you're you're working a bigger range of muscles in your legs when you have to navigate hills and descents rather than just like up in Belfast. The surface was reinforced concrete. So it's concrete with a steel plate underneath it. Like there was like I, I was I was trying to work this out beforehand. I was saying, like, how is concrete harder than tarmac? Like if you took me up to a second floor window. And said, "There's concrete. There's tarmac. Which do you want me to throw you out on?" I'd be like, <laughs> "You pick." Like, but like there is, <laughs> there is a significant difference in it. Like, you know, there's just it's just unforgiving, and like that Belfast, even for crew, like just the fact that like Daniel Farrell that was crewing me, he, he like you know, I'd see them every mile, so I never got a real chance to find a state of flow because every mile. They're, you know, they're assessing you, you know, they'll offer you something, hydration, nutrition, like, like, you know, every, every mile was like, like a, like a reset. Whereas in Connemara, I was able to get out on the road and just run, you know, you'd find your flow. You might do 10 kilometers without knowing you did 10 kilometers. Um, You'd like, like, again, just working towards the next town that you might have road signs saying like 10 kilometers to round stone, five kilometers to round stone. Like it was just the perpetualness of Belfast just made it, made it hugely difficult. And then I suppose in Connemara, the way I ran the race was I said, I was going to run five minute kilometers 
straight through. And I did at the start, but then like I ended up lagging back a bit just because I said, look, I want to, I'm in front. I want to maintain my lead, but I also want to finish. Yeah. But I ended up running, like I ended up running my, say, fastest split at the end of that. Like say from from one twenty kilometers onwards, I had like an average four twenty five per kilometer pace. I think to to finish in Connemara. So I just had I just had huge strength at at getting there and achieving that much. But I didn't want to leave it to chance in Belfast because I said if I tried it in Belfast. Again, like, you know, there'd be nothing worse than coming to the 120 mark and going, shit, I fucked up. Like, I'm not going to be able to do it. So what I did in Belfast this time was I took off, not the same speed, but I put down a fast 50K. So in this 100 mile, I did my third fastest 50K time. And I've done Donna D and everything. Like, you know, I like the 50K distance, but I did my third fastest 50K time in the first 50K of the 160k race and then because i was just like you know i was like write the check then you'll see if you can cash it like you know yeah. it's like yeah. <laughs> i was like you know like that that's that's skin in the game to like you know to to go out early to go hard early and then just kind of sustain after that so from 50k i just had a strategy of pulsing my pace so i did 10k at 450 pace 10k at 455 10k at five minute pace and went up and down through them just to break it up because like like with the mile loops first of all they can keep their miles up there like you know i work in kilometers i i didn't change my watch or i didn't set the loop or anything like i was running in kilometers like i would have trained anyway and like the mile loop even with eight eight miles to go in the race or sorry yeah with eight miles to go say the person on the time and said to me eight loops to go and I went for the first time I went from counting in kilometers counting in loops and it nearly killed me because to go from kilometer to kilometer all of a sudden to go from basically mile to mile by going from loop eight to loop seven to loop six a little bit longer yeah it just it just literally it rattled me and I went back to kilometers then and it seemed even though you're doing the same race the same distance <laughs> to go I went back to counting in kilometers and I was like oh no this is grand I'm gonna get there like it's the only thing you've said in this podcast so far that I can relate to because I <laughs> <laughs> so you can't even count would you stop? <laughs> no but I did the backyard ultra I remember saying oh I've yeah. only got 10 laps to go or something like, to yeah. get it because they do it in laps and the first time I went to, to to laps I was like this feels like fucking forever unlike yeah. you I wasn't smart enough to go back to kilometers on it because the, the watch was different things so I was but it just yeah. And that was only a 1.3 for, for a lap. Yeah. But even that extra 0.3, so compared to 0.6, and at that stage of running, I was like, my God, it just felt so, so different. Yeah, but it is. It's, it's them little mind games. I said this, I was actually talking to somebody earlier today, and I was just telling them about how, like even on my training runs, like when I did my first, say in, in, in this training block for it, when I did my first 50K, like I was bet from 45 to 50. Yet when I did 65K, 45 to 50 was grand. And it was yeah. 60 to 65. <laughs> and then when I did 80, was I actually 80K was the longest trade run I did for this race. And like, you know, then at 65, I was grand. And it's it's 75 to 80. That, that, that was the difficult bit. You yeah, know, people so, have done, done a D is like when they get that 42K mark, they're not even thinking, oh shit, I'll, I'll be bet after the marathon. That last 8K is when it starts to kick in for them. Like, yeah yeah so like that's just kind of that's the way i was kind of surmising it is look it's like do you know if you if you needed to go to the toilet and you know you have to go and you could hold it for <laughs> half an hour but as, as soon as you put your hand on that bathroom door you're like i'm gone i'm not going to make it the rest of the way like, you know? <laughs> Get them but off. it does just it does just show how much the mind does play now obviously there's yeah. training and consistency that's involved yeah. in everything you're doing and, and a little mm. bit of just go for it and see what happens and, and feel the fear and, and do it anyway. And I tend to make deals with my body. So if I know I'm going running a 10K and Sean goes, ah, now, okay, I can stretch it. But if Sean goes, we're going to go do another 10K right now, I'd be like, no, I made me deals. 
It was 10K and that's all we are going to do. <laughs> and this kind of what you're saying, leading in the 65 gets harder, the 80. Mm. Are you having them battles when you're running? Are, are you, do you make them deals with your body? And is it, is it when you reach that limit, you cycle around Ireland, you do your 100, is that you done then? Have, have you maxed out at that? Look, I feel it the same as anybody else. Like, you know, again, there's nothing different about me, only only maybe experience and, and knowledge from my experiences on what I can go through. Like, like there was thousands of times that it crossed my mind to quit, to stop. I remember looking at people sitting down and going, you fuckers, you don't know how well you have it. Just being able to, <laughs> sit, just being able to sit on the grass, look at you on your stool or look at you driving your car. <laughs> like, you know, like I started getting resentful to anybody at rest. And like, even I remember at a hundred K, like I was, I was, I, I, I'd nearly won myself over saying, look, you deserve it. You can stop for five minutes. Say you need to regroup. Say you just need to get your thoughts straight or you need to get your mind straight. You need to close your eyes for a few minutes. But then I just tell myself, do you know what? I said that to myself at 60K too. And if I had took that 60K at five minutes, if I had took that five minutes at 60K, I wouldn't remember it now. It wouldn't have done me any good. And it'll be five minutes longer at the end of the race I'm running. So like, that's the joys of like, I know there's 12 hour racing and 24 hour racing. But what I like about the hundred mile is that the faster you run, the less time you have to run for. (laughs) (laughs) And and in Sean's case, if he hurries up, the less time we have to crew. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that's what I made the most out of my ticket. All right, <laughs> he only gets yeah. half the time out of his value from winning that one. I I double it. It's great. Yeah, Stephen, yeah, but like how, that, yeah. Sorry, go on. How's the body? Like like all these challenges and stuff. I know you struggled a little bit at the start of the year, but mm-hmm. like the, the the miles you talk about doing doubles a day, you talk about the odd triple going towards more than odd triple towards uh, towards an event. Like how how is the the, the body holding up? I know you you train yourself and I feel. It, look, it's it's really good. Um, I focus a lot on my strength and conditioning as well. I wouldn't be a big stretcher. I'm not going to lie. I'm a crisis stretcher. Do you know when something's already gone wrong? It's like get out the foam roller. <laughs> Second yeah. thing we agree with John. The roller of repent. Mm. It's, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, like <clears throat> I just sometimes I think is that it was a blessing that I was never picked for the teams when I was younger or that like I was never kind of putting load on my body bar the weight I was carrying as a child and as a teenager and that because like even I suppose when you see people that are playing hurling and football and that now do you know they all have crooked fingers bad knees blown ACLs yep I think like I've been constantly training now for six years like I've never really had downtime or an off season but I think it's the variability in what I do that keeps it sustainable like my body is in very good condition I've no even now even like like what four days after finishing the race like I know there is damage done if you finish a race of this nature you are injured regardless but like, no, my body's been very good. It doesn't ask for much. It's never fought back. Like, I would say after, like, look, and everybody comes to a stage where they think they're invincible to find out they're not. And that's what I found out at Christmas time, because I suppose, not that it was an injustice, but after Connemara, when I couldn't comprehend how I'd ran the fastest 100 mile distance anybody ever had in Ireland yet I wasn't being acknowledged as having the Irish record like I couldn't get that into my head like how how I couldn't justify how that was fair but I just said look here's here's the ticket to your next challenge you know get on board because I said I am going to I am going to get it I said I'm not going to I'm not going to have a chip on my shoulder about it I'm not going to talk about it you know I'm not going to say well I do have it because I didn't like you know like rules are the rules it's like like Sean if you came out next week and said oh look I'm after doing a faster 100 mile than Steve like you know like it's it has to be done like like for ultra running it's it's IAU bronze label or silver label standard but I 
said I was going to do with New Year's Eve in leak slip on the track um, across the years. And like even after Connemara, like I, when I ran Connemara two weeks later, I did a half marathon PB in Tullamore. Like, you know, just, just like, you know, just absolutely just, no regard for my go body do for recovery. <laughs> but that, no, but look, that's it's it. Like, good. and I don't know. Is it that you like, you know, that was just, it was part of an endurance series. And I said, oh, look, I have to finish out the endurance series. But like, it's only when you go through injury and you have to sit there and think about your actions and think about how oblivious you were to the signs at the time, because I was ramping up straight from that, didn't stop at all. And I said, you know, New Year's Eve, I'm going to set the new Irish 100 mile record on track. And I was getting, I was getting like pains in my shins and I was stopping to stretch it out. <laughs> like, you know, I, I was just like, <laughs> like just absolute, it's not even ignorance because you obviously don't know. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. you no clue if that's what you're doing. And I was going out for hard runs and saying, I'll stretch it out. And, ah, uh, you know, it's just a, a bit of tightness there or whatever. But like, it was, it was stress reaction at the time. Like, you know, my body was asking me to stop. It was saying, give it a rest, give it a break. And I did everything bare listening to it. I wore supports. I wore the most cushioned shoes I could. And I just stayed ramping up until eventually, like just before Christmas, before the race, I got in for an MRI. I was going to still do the race. And I had a 10, a 10 centimeter stress fracture in my tibia. Like if I'd, if I'd went to that race, I probably would have ran to it being a clean break. And, you know, that's when I just knew. Yeah, that's when I knew I was kind of like, like, you know, it's like, you're not invincible. Like, you know, and I was gutted because I was on the countdown to doing this and I had tunnel vision with it. But since then, that's why I do the double days rather than doing just long runs every evening, because I want to be a lot more intuitive about how I feel, how my body's feeling, how I'm recovering my ability to get back right for the next run or for the next training session and then I did a lot of lower leg strengthening exercises as well I did a lot of tip raises lunges calf raises everything just to build more robust legs so that it wouldn't happen again and like even in the taper before Belfast like I know I've I've read and heard about people getting phantom aches and that during taper periods but like I could feel an a little ache in in my tibia just where the where the stress fracture was and I was going up to run on this surface that's known for causing stress fractures like people oh. have spoken about the course in Belfast being a recipe for stress fractures and to be honest like there was probably an 80 percent chance in my head that that it was going to be my downfall was going to be that my injury would recur, that it would flare up. And if it had, I would have been a ticking time bomb. Like, you know, you wouldn't like, like something like that ends your race. Yeah. But I, I was just hugely fortunate. And like, I suppose it was that I was preemptive about it by dividing the load of my workouts by doing my strength and doing my rehab yeah it just worked out but like that it's it's something that again I was sulking I was having a little pity party at the time when it happened you know I felt like it feels like you fall out of all your circles do you know like where you'd be going running with all your friends and that all of a sudden you're like nobody even talks to me when I'm not running or like you know (laughs) you're Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're weak. You're weak. <laughs> look but, at you and your weak shins, huh? <laughs> yeah, but like, look, it goes back to the same thing again. <laughs> Only one of them. Uh, <laughs> but like, it, it goes back to the same thing again that like, you know, it's like, like, you know, stop seeing the wrong aspect of what you're going through and see the lesson in it. Like, you know, it's it's the lesson in it is that you're not invincible like you know if your body tells you something you listen except during races because then you don't listen you just push through but like you know like that like you know it's better to catch something in the moment and treat it than let it go to an injury that 
you could potentially carry for the rest of your life. Like, you know, you hear about so many people with a bad knee because of an injury or uh, like bad shoulder, whatever, like, you know, like all that, yeah. there was a point in time where that could have been caught and prevented and it wasn't. So like for me, I think it was maybe a small price to pay where at the time I thought, I thought it, it was like I was after putting so much into Belf or into the 24 hour for New Year's Eve. I thought, you know, like that it was, I thought it was a failure, but it wasn't like, cause the fact is I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done the time I did in Belfast on New Year's Eve. And just by having patience, by having patience, by trusting the process and just going in to execute, like, you know, I knew like I would have barreled into the race New Year's Eve, like going up to Belfast. I knew what I was going to do. Like, you know, I'd said like to Dan, like, Daniel Farrell, my, my, he, he crews me for all these things. He's brilliant. He has, he has a pastry pace run club up in Stony Batter. But I said to Dan, will you crew me for it? He's like, I'll crew you if you're going to win. I was like, yeah, that's what I said. Like, will you crew me for it? Like, we're going to win. Like, you know, obviously we're going to win. We're going for the Irish record. That's what we're going for. It's not to participate. It's not to, it's not to just kind of do the distance. It's going to do what I've trained 10 months to do. And like that, I set out 10 months ago that I was going to do this and now it's done. So like, like that, it is great to execute on it. How was that feeling, Frost, and that, like to to go through those ups and downs, especially with leagues up and all the rest and unofficially, even over the legs, say officially, you did a hundred miles and then to finally get that time in, like, and, I suppose at the last couple of K, like when you, when you knew it was in, in the bank, yeah. like how was that feeling? Do you know what? It not great, to be honest. It's not like it's it's like all these things. On, upon reflection, it's the process where the enjoyment is. And it's mm. it's the times that you think are the struggles are actually the best times. Like like when I crossed the finish line, I felt like death. Like, you know, like I didn't feel good even the last few days since it. Like, obviously waking up on Sunday, having achieved my goal was phenomenal. But, and it's something that people have to see in people around them is that there's a serious low to it afterwards. Like I've spent the last three days and I, I just know it's a, it's a, it's a thing now. I know that to expect it. I, I have it in my journal for the last seven weeks for these days to expect to be low on that, that like after the high highs, it's not elation or it's not, you're not going around on cloud nine. Like, you know, you are, injured your low mood your low energy everything in life is tougher you're gone back from having a guiding light to maybe still having a guiding light but it being way off in the distance so like you know it's not it's not something that it's a finish line like you know it's just a checkpoint that's all it is and again you're it's probably not up at half five in the morning and going <laughs> this, this week over runs either so your whole no, routine has changed <laughs> but but that's the thing like you know like it's 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 not it's not like my life goal to do any of these things do you know it's just a procession it's just it's done now and i recover and like because the that, thing is at what point Stephen, did you decide that coming onto our podcast was a coping mechanism <laughs> Again, I, I was told you were good listeners. <laughs> yeah. and, and when I is heard this Sean, now the high? And, well, is, is this? Yeah. Is this? Yeah. When I heard Sean's mind? time, I said. When I heard Sean's time, I said, even if I, even if what I say is terrible, you know, like it, this is going to be impressive. Move us swiftly on, Stephen. What is a Spartathlon? <laughs> uh, Spartathlon is Athens. Oh, Spartathlon. Gr- I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a race from it's from Athens to Greece. It's 250 kilometers and it is 3000 meters elevation. It's a historic route, say in Greek mythology. I can't even pronounce these lads names, but like the marathon distance comes from the distance from marathon to Athens. Mm -hmm. So that's 42 kilometers. And there was a messenger that had to deliver a message about an invading army to this distance. But then there was another guy who ran from Athens to Sparta with the same message, but it was 250 kilometers. And I think it was in the 70s or 80s, four SAS officers said they were going to redo this route. 
and they were going to see if it was possible to complete it. And they did complete it and it's become a race since. So it's it's one of the world's toughest ultras. Like, especially you hear about, like, I think it's something like 42 or 43 degrees in Greece at the moment. So that's what you'd be dealing with. But I suppose I got to qualify in time for this from Connemara last year. And that's kind of the way these things come. Not good enough to be a record, but you can qualify for this one from it. Yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that. And, you know, it's something on an international stage. And I suppose in a lot of ways, I'm saying, like, life gets more and more in the way on these things. And I never like putting things off into the future because you don't know when you're ever going to get to do them again. Or you don't, don't ever know when it might be your last time to have the physical ability to do something like that. Like you see all around us, you know, between illness, injury, anything like life is fickle and you only have so many goals at these things. And to be able to do them is a great honor to want to do them is madness but it's like you know it 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 makes it possible and i'd love to just be able to like when i'm an old lad sitting at the corner of the bar drinking telling young lads that i ran 250 kilometers from athens to sparta and they're like no you didn't go away or <laughs> like you know it's just yeah i'd like to just say that i did everything and i think again it goes back to what i said about that 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 haunting phrase i had at the start of all this, that was, there's nothing worse in life than wasted potential. And to see the ability to do these things and capital capitalize upon it, like it does come with great sacrifice. Like, like Spartathlon could cost me four or 5,000 euros of my own money to do unless you want to sponsor me, lads. It'd be great for the show. Well, he threw that whole cycle across yeah. America right back, Jay. I'm Jay and Eric. Yeah. Eric. Well, he did. Yeah. He did, did mention me Dan and know. his run. He did mention yeah. Dan and his run club. So Dan either has to come on the podcast or give us a million euros, and we can use that million to sponsor you. So it, it's a win-win <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. Look, like these things, like there's only a finite amount of time that you do it. You know, the thing is, if, if not now, when that's it. Like, you know, I'm kind of the way I like moving from discipline to discipline or whatever interests me. I like, I like ticking off boxes. Like I, I don't rush these things. I'm willing to play the long game, but always just to have something in the barrel. And it makes you interesting as well. I love when people, do you know, when people just have a curi- curiosity, like, what's next or what are you going to do next? Or like all these are silent goals for the most part, like with the hundred mile race, like I don't, I don't put it up on social media that I'm doing it. I don't try to talk about it day to day. You know, this is just something that I do for me. And like at this time, it is great to, I suppose, get a sense of achievement and get to share what you've been working on with everybody. But like, I'll go back to work again now. I'll go back quiet. People won't know what I'm doing, what I'm up to, bar the fact that I've told the world now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, it, it's, it just gives me purpose. And in a way, it's it's like a metronome to life because like when I'm training well, I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well. Like when my time is more limited, otherwise I'm spending that time better with the people I love most, that I appreciate most. Like, again, with making sacrifices, making the sacrifices and the cost of them sacrifices just justifies what you're doing means a lot to you and that it is the correct thing for you to be doing. So, look, it's it all kind of everything for me leads back to to running really at the moment. And like, it's great talking about all these events and that, but. I love getting out for like a little 5k after a day in work or, you know, doing a park run or doing like doing run club or like I'm the worst person to bring on a stag because I'll know every inch of that city by the time that they've had their first few pints. Cause I go away. The first thing I do is I put on my runners or like that. If you go traveling or like you've got, you've, you might've found out in the middle East that like, you know, it's a great way to make connections that like, you know, you find a run club or you, you meet people similar and straight away, like there's an alignment there or there's like, 
there's a community wherever you go with it. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. I was lucky enough with the Adidas Run Club in Dubai. Uh, yeah. I haven't uh, settled into one here, and it's also 47 degrees here today. So yeah. the most I can do is just about walk a 5K. <laughs> Never yeah, mind. My, yeah. goal, my goal is to wait till it hits about 47 and try and run a, a, a 25 minute 5k and try not to die but it's yeah. um it's it like anything that you involve sport i suppose is it's the language in itself you know you don't need to have like there was other people who had broken english there's people who barely any english but everyone mm-hmm. understood when you're running and a, a thumbs up and a hard work you know it's and it is great it's a great way to meet people and I suppose when you're a silent operator like yourself and you don't get an opportunity to talk about it, it's nice when you get an opportunity to sit down with other runners and talk about it. Otherwise, it's it yeah. can be frustrating. Oh, exactly, because like there's nothing worse even like for like even say the last week. I remember before the race, I was I was in the sauna, just literally trying to do anything I could just to like relax, calm myself before the race. And somebody beside treadmill. me. <laughs> yeah, 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 doing good jobs. Yeah. But the person beside me goes, like, it's like they said they said something and something came up about running. And I said I had a race next week. And I was like, oh no. no. I knew they were gonna say what kind of race. And I said a hundred mile. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's just like they're just like asking you kind of baseline questions, like, you know, like asking, how can you run a hundred miles? And it's like, you know, it's, it's just I had to get out of the sauna and leave. But, you know, when you're around runners or anything like, you know, they'd have an appreciation for it. And the same, like, like I, I'm i always when people say like when runners say like, I'd love to be able to do what you're doing. Like, you know, there was a day that I moved that rock 300 meters saying I'd love to move it 400 meters. Like, you know, it's all relative. Everything's relative. Like even where I am now, like, you know, like it's typical Irish people, like, you know, to cut you down. But like after my hundred mile time, people will say like, and what's the world record or what's the world standard? And I'd be like, oh, I wouldn't be close to that. But like, can you not just give me this much? <laughs> <laughs> just say, well done. and <laughs> Good luck with the next race. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And on that note, Stephen, uh, that's a great way. Hold to on, go Sean. Hold on. What is the world record? did you did you come up with a few things that uh that you could uh, that you could have done between my time and sean's time yeah so you could have roasted a whole turkey and simultaneously cut the grass you could have <laughs> dropped the kids to school brought them back <laughs> From school and let them do it. Made a couple of day. kids by the time it took me to finish the yeah. race. <laughs> they could have ran out. They could have ran a hundred miles. I'm only resting. That's impressive, Shawnee. <laughs> I know. Look, I, I slag and I'm running five k's here like I'm a legend. But it's yeah. Look, it's everyone as as you correctly said. Everyone has their own race. Everyone has their own mm. uh, ambitions and motivations. Yours is exceptional. It's it's very impressive to to be with an athlete so humble about it and we can only wish you the very best in the next events you're coming up and and with the spartathon i think it is that's coming up yeah. and uh <laughs> you pronounced it wrong didn't you vote you did ah, <laughs> 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 who's editing but, but now that now they're coming on the podcast as part of your pick me up when you're feeling down we look forward to hearing the review from that race <laughs> towards yeah. the end of it when it happens uh, but it's been absolutely brilliant having you on i know sean is dying to close this one out i can see in his face he's about to make a bollocks <laughs> at the outro never mind the intro <laughs> Say Spartan Say there, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you put it, uh, your, your your next checkpoint, not a finish line. Good luck at whatever your next checkpoint may be. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and on that note, that's it for myself, Stephen, and Eric. Take care.